Hi, this is Dr. Ross, and this is um, Urinary Presentation 1 for mine and Dr. Camp's class um, for Anatomy and Physiology 2. Uh, we are going to go over urinary anatomy, uh, urinary microanatomy. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, blood flow and urine flow, and just a few slides will be on histology at the very end. So let's get started. The urinary tract is the body's drainage system for the eventual removal of urine. Um, so the main purpose of the urinary system is to filter or remove waste from the body. Remember, our cells uh, that are in our body are constantly working, which means they're metabolizing substances, and this creates waste products, and those waste products need to be removed before they become toxic. Uh, we can also create things that need to be removed uh, or, or waste that needs to be removed from uh, metabol metabolizing drugs or other toxins that make their way into our body. Um, the urinary system also regulates blood volume and blood pressure. So uh, the regulation of blood volume is done by increasing the amount of water um, increased or released from the body, from the blood. So if blood volume is too low, if we're dehydrated, water can be reabsorbed um, and the blood volume will increase. Now remember, blood volume and pressure are intimately related. So if blood pressure is too high or too low, the urinary system can help correct this by altering blood volume. So for example, if blood pressure is too high, then more water can be removed. This will decrease the volume of blood and decrease blood pressure. The urinary system also controls levels of electrolytes um, uh, or controls reg um, levels of ions. It regulates ion concentrations. Uh, this includes electrolytes such as sodium, chloride, potassium. Things like sodium um, can be altered in concentration. This is going to help regulate osmolarity, um, while changing the amount of hydrogen ions will help regulate the pH. The organs of the urinary system include the kidneys the ureters, the bladder, and the urethra. So there are two kidneys, um, which are those purplish brown bean-shaped organs located below the ribs toward the middle of the back. Their function is to remove waste and drugs from the body, balance body fluids, which I've already mentioned. Kidneys also release hormones to regulate blood pressure and control production of red blood cells. And we'll talk about these a little more in the physiology lecture. Uh, running from the kidneys to the bladder are these two tubes called the ureters. These narrow tubes, which run alongside the spine in this image here, uh, continually tighten and relax, forcing urine downward away from the kidneys. If urine backs up or is allowed to stand still, a kidney infection can develop. The ureters uh, deliver urine to the urinary bladder, which is that triangular kind of reddish organ down at the bottom. Uh, this organ is hollow. Uh, the walls of the bladder, when they relax and expand, uh, it allows the bladder to expand and store urine. When the bladder contracts and flattens, uh, it will empty urine through the urethra, which is that small tube leading from the uh, bladder. The, the urethra is just a tube that allows urine to pass outside of the body. The urinary bladder collects urine from both the ureters. The interior surface of the bladder is made of transitional epithelium, and you can see this in the panel in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, the transitional epithelium is located, um, is, is at the top, and it's being indicated by that arrow. The transitional epithelium is, struct is uh, suited um, structurally for the large fluctuations in volume that the bladder will have. So when the bladder is empty, transitional epithelium is going to resemble columnar epithelium, and when it's stretched, it's going to look more like squamous cells. The muscular layer of the bladder is called the detru detrusor muscle. The detrusor muscle is able to change its length to accommodate the movement of urine into and out of the bladder, and it is a smooth muscle. The inferior portion of the bladder has this triangular shaped area. Um, it's kind of light blue in this image at the base. Uh, this is called the trigone. This area serves, uh, one, it serves as a funnel to help drain urine uh, into the urethra, uh, but it's also very sensitive to expansion. And once it's stretched beyond a certain degree, it will signal to the brain that it needs to empty. Uh, the urethral openings are actually just above that trigone, and so you'll have to kind of imagine that the ureters run behind the bladder and they empty just above that structure uh, on either side. 
Uh, at the bottom, you see the internal urethral sp uh, sphincter. This is an involuntary, this is uh, under involuntary control, and then your external urethral sphincter, which is under voluntary control. Moving on to the kidneys, the kidney consists of three layers, the cortex, I'm sorry, starting with the capsule, the capsule is the outer layer, so if you were just looking at a kidney, you'd be looking at the capsule. The next layer on the inside is called the cortex, you can see the, the word right there in bright green. Uh, this contains all, uh, pretty much all the nephrons. Uh, there's a little bit of the nephron that extends into the medulla, um, but the cortex is basically the main part where urine is formed. The medulla, this inner area, um, is the inner region of the kidney and it contains the renal pyramids, which you see here in blue, as well as the columns, uh, renal columns, which are shown in dark red, or at least there's one shown in dark red. The renal pyramids um, are these cone-shaped tissues and they contain the collecting ducts where urine goes. So urine arrives in the collecting ducts after it's created, um, and then it flows into the uh, minor calyx, and then it moves into the major calyx, which is this cream-colored area here. Eventually, it will move to the, the, renal pel the renal pelvis, and then finally make its way out of the kidney through the ureter. Um, the renal hilum is this area uh, alongside uh, the kidney or is, is indicated alongside the kidney. The renal hilum is just the entry and exit site for structures uh, like the vessels, nerves, and lymphatics as well as the ureters. Um, am I forgetting anything? Oh, the renal columns, I forgot to mention. The renal columns are, uh, are, are, of course, what are separating the renal pyramids. They contain blood vessels as well as, con as connective tissue. So at this point, you have enough information if you want to start practice labeling the urinary anatomy using the images we loaded as well as the sticker sheet on Blackboard. Uh, the next part we're going to talk about in this presentation is the microstructure. Before we do that, I want to go over a couple of things that are just going to make it easier for you guys if you can remember them. So uh, the kidneys have two arterioles and two capillary beds. There's an afferent arteriole uh, that brings blood to um, the glomerular capillary. And then there's the efferent arterial, and that brings blood to the paratubular capillaries or the vasa recta. There are also the, um, the corpuscles. The corpuscles will filter the blood, and this allows the um, what, what goes through this filter will be called filtrate. This is going to um, include the glomerular capillaries and the glomerular capsule, as well as the podocytes. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those uh, today. The nephrons uh, modify the filtered blood, the filtered blood, the filtrate, and ultimately make urine. So the nephron is going to add things, which means secretion, or remove things, uh, called reabsorption, remove things and take them back into the blood. This is going to include the tubules, your proximal convoluted tube, your nephron loop, and your distal convoluted tube. Um, and then finally, those are going to feed into what's called the collecting ducts, and the collecting ducts drain urine into the calyces. And I already talked about uh, uh, where the path was from there on the previous so this is the microstructure here on the right of the slide called the nephron uh, that we're going to discuss. This basically does the essential work of the kidney, which is taking a simple filtrate of blood and modifying it into urine. Each kidney has about a million of these, and basically uh, blood enters the kidney uh, through the renal artery, and then it kind of works its way through smaller and smaller arteries, eventually arriving at the nephron at the afferent arteriole, which is shown here. And then the blood from the afferent arteriole is going to be filtered through the glomerulus. Um, and then what comes out the other side of the glomerulus into that beige tube is going to be called the filtrate. What's remaining in the blood will exit through that efferent arteriole. Okay, so this is the glomerulus here, just to orient you. So as, as uh, the filtrate leaves the glomerulus into this cream-colored tube, it arrives in the proximal convoluted tube. Uh, it's going to flow from there through the nephron loop, which dips down to the bottom. Uh, in this slide, it's called the loop of Henley, which is an old name. Uh, we refer to it as the nephron uh, loop now. It's going to go back up that loop into the distal convoluted tube, uh, or convoluted tubule. 
And in these, in this proximal a convoluted tubule, the nephron loop, as well as the distal convoluted tubule, this is where um, absorption and secretion is occurring. So some nutrients are being reabsorbed into the blood and some more waste are being secreted into uh, uh, in this area, ultimately, which will end up in the urine. So the filtrate travels along there uh, and ultimately the filtrate is going to move into the collecting duct, and when it gets to the collecting duct, we refer to that as urine. Uh, you see these blood vessels running alongside the tubules. Um, these blood vessels are there to reabsorb the uh, nutrients or electrolytes that we want to return to the blood system. Uh, the blood vessels uh, that are wrapped around uh, the loop of Henle or the nephron loop uh, are called the vasorecta, and the, the capillaries up here at the top that are wrapped around the convoluted tubules are called the peritubular capillaries. Next, I want to talk a little bit about um, the, uh, the glomerulus on this slide. So the glomerulus, which is located here, is um, it's a capillary bed. It's unique because there's a, it's this very high pressure um, capillary bed located between the efferent and afferent arterioles. Remember, blood arrives there through the afferent arteriole. Uh, the capillaries in the glomerulus are fenestrated, and this is to maximize the amount of liquid that moves through here to become filtrate. The glomerulus is covered with podocytes, and they, in this image, they kind of look like feathers. Uh, so these are cells with finger-like arms that cover the glomerular capillaries. And we're gonna discuss a little bit more how those work during the physiology lecture. At this point, you can now move on to labeling. Uh, you have both the macro and micro anatomy information you need to proceed with that. Um, the rest of this lecture will focus on tracing kidney, uh, tracing blood flow through the kidney, as well as urine infiltrate, uh, and finally histology. So next, let's talk about tracing blood flow. So as I mentioned, blood enters the kidney through the renal artery. Uh, and if you can look over this while looking at an image of a kidney that has the vessels on it, it would probably be more helpful. So blood enters through the renal artery and then makes its way through smaller and smaller arteries, uh, as I said, uh, getting to the glomerulus. And so let's talk about what those are. So we come in through the renal artery, and then you move into the segmental ar artery, then to the interlobar arteries, the arcuate arteries, the cortical radiate, um, which are also called interlobular arteries. From here, you're gonna to move to the afferent arteriole. And as I said in the previous slide, this is what feeds the glomerulus, uh, which is the first capillary bed we encounter. And of course, on the other side of that glomerulus is gonna be the filtrate and all the tubules. But we're talking about the blood. So from here, the blood uh, that is not uh, part of the filtrate is going to leave through the afferent arteriole. And then it is going to go to the peritubular capillary, uh, which is the capillary bed surrounding the, um, the, the convoluted tubules, or the vasa recta, which is a, another capillary bed, and that's surrounding the nephron loop. Uh, from there, it will, in, it will move to the interlobular veins. Remember, we are leaving a capillary bed, so we're moving into veins here. And then to the arcuate veins, the interlobar veins, eventually exiting the kidney through the renal vein. So now briefly, uh, let's walk through urine production. So like I said, blood comes in through the afferent arteriole and gets filtered by the glomerulus. And this fluid that exits the glomerulus is now called filtrate. The filtrate flows into the proximal convoluted tube. Um, and then here, 100% of the nutrients that made it into the filtrate, as well as 60% of the water and electrolytes are gonna be reabsorbed back into the blood. Um, certain nitrogenous wastes and drugs or toxins will be secreted into the filtrate. So they're gonna remain. The filtrate will now flow into the nephron loop, uh, and here fluid and electrolytes are gonna be reabsorbed. Okay, and so we're talking about sodium, potassium, and chloride, um, and this is going to be happening through osmosis and diffusion. I should have mentioned earlier, uh, the electrolytes that were getting reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tube are getting reabsorbed 
uh, through channels that are using active transport. So those are going against their concentration gradient and are requiring energy to do so. Here in the nephron loop, we are using osmosis and diffusion. So these are moving, um, these are moving along their concentration gradient. So from high to low concentration, requiring no energy. Uh, and they're using uh, membrane pores as well. All right, so once we leave the nephron loop, we're gonna flow into the distal convoluted tube. Uh, final adjustments are gonna be made here, mostly under the control of a bunch of hormones, which are listed here in green. We will talk more about those hormones in the physiology lecture. At this point, pH of the blood can also be adjusted by swapping acid and bicarbonate. Finally, the fluid will enter that collecting duct and we will call it urine. The collecting duct does still do some stuff. It reabsorbs a little bit of water, and this will be uh, under the control of antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. Then fluid will drain into the papillary duct, the minor calyx, then to the major calyx, finally to the renal pelvis, and then it will exit the kidney, kidney through the ureter. And so this is uh, tracing urinary, urinary, uh, urine production. Again, I think this would be best, um, most useful if you look at a nephron when you are going through this slide. So our last couple of slides are on histology. Uh, so we're gonna briefly discuss that. So the first slide is showing an entire kidney, allowing you to see some of the anatomy. You can also make out the renal cortex as well as the renal medulla, which is this lighter area. The renal cortex is this dark pink area. Uh, the medulla is this lighter area on the inside. Here we've zoomed in on the cortex and part of the medulla. Uh, you can make out the glomeruli, which are these number fours. Uh, you can see these, the glomeruli are, are being pointed at. Uh, you can also make out the, the convoluted tubules, which are being pointed to by the number five arrows. When you look in the medulla, particularly over by the seven, you can see the ends of those nephron loops. So you can see quite a bit of the micro anatomy when we look at the slides, at the histological slides. This last slide is showing the bladder. The left panel is showing the layers of the urinary bladder. So from left to right, on the left side, that white area would be considered the lumen where urine would be. Uh, and then that um, leftmost arrow, the number one arrow is um, the mucosa. Next to that, which is indicated by the, the two, which is a much wider area, that is the submucosa. And then the final right-hand side is uh, the muscularis. The right panel is showing the bladder epithelium, and you can see the transitional epithelium along the top. Uh, and then you can make out some of the uh, submucosa as well, as, we're, as this slide on this side is a little bit more zoomed in. So that is it for this slideshow. Um, you can now move on to the histology if you like, or you can move on to labeling.